Hi, and welcome to Food Safety The Basics. This is a bit of an introduction uh, as part of your induction to food safety. So we're going to cover all the basics of food safety here. So as when you're actually working in your business, you're going to be able to make sure that you keep you, your customers, and the business safe. So my name's Rochelle Williams. And I'm the Green Food Safety Coach. So I've been running training in food safety and, and, uh, and also in what's now called sustainability. In other words, helping the environment while saving money for businesses for about 13 years now. So I also do audits and I'm, uh, I thoroughly enjoy running training. I support businesses. So I help them develop food safety programs, quality systems and HACCP. So I've been at it for a while, got a whole variety of different clients. And that's me at the bottom of the page there. And I'm actually, uh, I'm I'm, I'm sitting here uh, at my desk as I'm actually in the same place you see me there uh, as I'm actually doing this uh, this webinar today. All right, so let's get into what we're actually going to cover today. All right, first of all, there's nine things we're going to cover fairly quickly. We've only we're going to do this in less than an hour. So food poisoning, we're going to be uh, talking about what food poisoning is and how bad it is and why it is an issue. Food safety, what we've got to do to control. Uh, food safety and why it's important. What are the potentially hazardous foods and why you've got to keep an eye on them and why they've got to be managed. Next is high risk groups, who they are and whether your business actually targets them. In, in other words, and if you do, if your business does, what your business has to do on top of what normal business or other businesses would do. The uh, three types of hazards, we'll talk about things like cross-contamination and contamination. A bit about temperature control, there's a few temperatures that you absolutely need to know and we'll talk a little bit about things like the two four hour rule and, uh, and, and the relationship between time and temperature. Stock rotation. We'll talk about a very, very important thing called first in, first out, or FIFO as it's known. Uh, quickly talk about food allergens, and then we'll get into the importance of hygiene and hand washing. So that's what we're going to cover today. So let's get into it. First of all, food poisoning. As I've actually got on it, and I apologize, I've got a bit of a, uh, I have a bit of an allergy, so I'm going to try not to keep sneezing. Uh, but we'll see how we go. All right, how many? It's estimated in Australia, as I've got on this slide, that there's about four, at least four million cases of food poisoning in Australia each year. Now, if you work out that we've got a population of somewhere around the 22, 23 million people, now uh, we've probably got uh, about a, a one in six, between a one in five and a one in six chance of getting food poisoning this year. Now, uh, when, I, when I'm actually running uh, training for clients, uh, I often go around the room and get them to put up the hand who's had food poisoning this year so um, just stop and think about that who do you know that's had food poisoning this year um, or who have you ever had food poisoning and if you have there are some symptoms that are fairly typical now most people straight away would go vomiting and diarrhea they're the two top I guess most common symptoms of food poisoning but there's also things like nausea now nausea means that you're going to feel like you want to throw up but in fact you, you can't so it's that horrible feeling of wanting to throw uh, wanting to be sick but not being able to and that that is a horrible thing headaches uh, depending upon what sort of bacteria it is and what type of food poisoning you've got uh, you can get some really bad headaches uh, as a result of food poisoning fever that um, your temperature goes up you get sweats and uh, and you've got to keep on trying to keep yourself warm it's it's fever very bad cramps is is the last of the the most common symptoms of food poisoning and cramps is where you basically doubled up in pain in the abdominal region in your, in your tummy area and you get a lot of pain and so you're just doubled up in pain now most people when they get food poisoning will have vomiting and or diarrhea depending upon what you actually have uh, what sort of food poisoning you have now how quick can food poisoning come on it's actually called onset and as I've got on this slide here it actually depends entirely onset depends entirely upon the person the product you're actually that's been eaten and the pathogen. Now, pathogen is just a big name, a scientific name for food poisoning uh, microorganisms, or in other words, bacteria, viruses, molds, those type of things that can actually make you sick. So that's what a pathogen is. So I call this my rule of three, my 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 rule of three P's. And so if a person is, and we'll talk about this when we get to the high risk groups. The person, if they've got a really good and strong immune system, they're going to be less likely to get food poisoning. Uh, if they've got a good, strong immune system, if they get food poisoning, they're likely to get over it very quickly and have minimal effects. However, if their immune system is going down or is uh, or 
is down for for a variety of reasons, and we'll talk about that shortly, that particular person is more likely to get food poisoning, and if they do, they're more likely to be very, very sick. So the person is probably one of the most important things, but the product's also an issue because it depends upon what sort of product you've got. Different bacteria, for example, will like to grow in different types of foods. Uh, Golden staff, or as its proper name, Staphylococcus aureus, likes to grow in foods in things that are slightly salty, and that's because it like it actually lives on our skin, uh, or can live on people's skin. You'll find it very commonly in most on most people. They'll carry it at least sometime in their life, and we have little bits of salt on our skin because of the sweat. So therefore, this particular bacteria likes slightly salty environments. Other bacteria like things that are a bit hotter or a bit colder or some things like things that are a little bit lower in moisture. So it depends entirely upon um, the, the product. It, the product has a large part to play on whether somebody gets sick and how soon they can actually, uh, how long they're sick for. So the onset and the duration. Now the other thing that's really important here is some people believe that food poisoning will come and start as soon as you basically eat the food, or within you know four hours. But in some cases, depending upon these three Ps, it can actually take up to three to five days. So you cannot be 100% certain. So they need to take a sample of whatever it is that you're depositing, you know, the vomiting, diarrhea. They'll take samples from the food business. Uh, this is the health departments. So they'll take samples of that, and they can then test and find out what sort of pathogen was actually involved. And from that, they would then be able to work out where it came from and how it came about. So that's the basic rules. Um, one thing just to be aware of, most people think, as we said there, with vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, headaches, etc., that they are these symptoms. No, they're not the only symptoms. They're the common ones. They're the ones that the majority of people will have. But there are some food poisoning cases where you can end up with severe uh, long-term effects. Um, as a good example, one of the biggest food poisonings in Australian history was actually what's called the Garibaldi case. And uh, Garibaldi was the manufacturer in Adelaide, or well, South Australia, of uh, small goods. And those small goods, uh, the, the particular one that caused the issue was what's called a garlic metwurst. So if you think about something like a salami, um, it's not a salami, but it is the same sort of product. So this particular garlic metwurst uh, contained E. coli, and unfortunately it was it was sold with, this, with the, the E. coli in it, and as a result, 70-odd um, people consumed this product and one little girl died. And that little girl died from internal hemorrhaging. You know, her organs basically shut down, particularly around the, the, the kidneys. Um, recently, we had a... Um, a food poisoning, one of the, the biggest food poisoning in world history. Once again, it was E. coli, and uh, it actually ended up with three thousand people with food poisoning. Not Australian, uh, not in Australia. It was actually in in Europe, Germany particularly, uh, and three thousand people ended up with food poisoning. And of of that, fifty people actually died as a result of this um, internal damage that the bacteria actually caused. Now, there was a there's a good story of a of a girl who had who was uh, another girl in the um, the Garibaldi incident that happened in Australia, and she ended up with food poisoning from the, the E. coli, from eating garlic metwurst, and she only had a small amount of the garlic metwurst. And she ended up with kidney failure, and as a result of the kidney failure, um, she ended up with basically only one kidney, and uh, she lived with that for most of her life, and then she wanted to become pregnant and have a baby because she'd been married and they wanted to have a child, and so she had to go into a dialysis for the whole term of the pregnancy to be able to um, to carry the child. So, food poisoning is not just about vomiting, diarrhea, etc. It can be a lifetime of suffering as a result of eating a food that has been contaminated or has not been properly handled. So that's what food poisoning is all about. It is serious. It can kill people and it has potentially long-term effects. All right, now why control food poisoning? It's really about protecting. It's about meeting the law and protecting four groups. And the first group is obviously the customers, making sure that they don't get sick from the food that you're actually supplying them or serving them. The next is protecting the staff because if, you've, if there's rules and you will find out the rules as you go through your induction and as you, you are trained into your various areas and your roles, you'll find that there are certain rules or certain procedures or methods that need to be followed. Follow them. Don't go changing them. Don't go making up your own rules. Follow the rules and you will be protected. That's what food safety is about. If you have the food safety programs or controls, temperature checks, whatever it might be, are in place to protect 
the customers and make sure that the food is safe for them to eat, to protect you, because if you follow those rules, you'll make sure that, you're, that the business is protecting you. It'll actually protect the business, because as long as all of those rules are being followed, and as long as the rules have been properly set up to start with, then the business will be protected and is unlikely to end up hurting somebody or potentially killing somebody, and it will not go out of business and it'll continue to grow. The other thing is this, it will also protect the industry. Now, the Garibaldi incident that I mentioned before with the garlic networks, most people, uh, it was really interesting that all around Australia, the sales of products like salami, small goods like salami, dropped significantly after the Garibaldi incident. So small goods sales in Australia dropped through the roof, uh, dropped through the floor because there'd been a well-publicized um, small goods food poisoning that had actually happened. And as a result of that, it impacted the every single food business or manufacturer of small goods in Australia. So it can affect, if, if we don't have good food safety, we can actually hurt customers and potentially kill them. We are going to definitely affect staff because they may lose their jobs. And if staff aren't doing the right thing, there's a potential, depending upon what state in Australia and wherever else in the world you may be, that there, there's a potential for staff, if they haven't done the right thing in following those rules and done whatever they wanted to do and somebody has become ill as a result of it, there's a potential for those staff members or that particular staff member to go to jail as a result of that incident. It protects the business to make sure that it continues to trade and it also protects the industry. So food safety is a really important thing. That's why you're doing training today. There's also in Queensland, which is where I'm based, and in all other states of Australia, this is the same sort of set up. We have what's called the Food Standards Code, which is a nationally agreed set of requirements in all states and territories of Australia. And other countries have similar uh, requirements in place. It'll be called different things, but it's the same basic requirements. In terms of food safety, in our what we call the Food Standards Code, we have a chapter. It's a four-chapter code. I think of it as a book. In the fourth chapter, the third chapter, sorry, of that particular code or book, um, it is called the Food Safety Standards. And this is where all the requirements are in terms of food safety is set for the whole of Australia, for every business within Australia. So all of those rules I was mentioning before are based upon the requirements that are in Chapter 3 of our Food Standards Code. And then on top of this nationally agreed set of requirements, we each have in each state and territory, and it would be similar in other places around the world, um, what is called a Food Act. And that Food Act has the specific requirements in terms of food safety and food businesses in Queensland. So, for example, here it talks about registration of businesses, it talks about having food safety supervisors, it talks about a whole variety of a few things that are specific just for this state, on top of the nationally agreed requirements. So that's the law. That's the things we've got to meet. If we meet those, we're going to be doing that protection. Now, these are the mandatory requirements. Now, in Chapter 3, as I mentioned, of the Food Standards Code, our nationally agreed set of requirements, these are the mandatories. These are the ones that all food businesses, regardless of how big they are, need to make sure they're meeting. There is one, one thing on here that I just need to point out. I'm not going to go through all of these because we're just doing an induction today. We're not doing a full food safety training. If we were, we'd go into more detail. But these are the basic mandatory requirements. Mandatory meaning these are the law. There's only one there that isn't necessarily law in all food businesses, and that's product recall. If you're working in a cafe or a restaurant or an aged care centre, as an example, you do not have to have a product recall program because product recall programs are only for food businesses that sell to other food businesses. And if your business is not doing that, you, your business does not have to have a product recall, but it is still a mandatory requirement for those food businesses selling to other food businesses. So that's why we need to control food safety. All right. These are the potentially hazardous foods. There are, as you can see, nine of them. The first, and I'll very quickly read them out, meat, poultry, seafood, cut fruit and vegetables, cooked rice and pasta, dairy foods, eggs, meat alternatives, and any food containing these. Now, I'm not going to do them in the order they're on the screen. I'm going to go all over the place here. But first of all, I want to talk about meat alternatives. Now, I'm a vegetarian. I'm what's called an ovo-lacto-vegetarian. So I eat dairy foods and I eat eggs, but I do not eat anything that I would consider to be meat. And I'll explain what I mean by meat as a vegetarian in a minute, which is different to the definition for meat for being in terms of food safety. I'll explain that shortly. But meat alternatives are any food product that is actually used by people like me as vegetarians instead of eating meat. So these would be things like soybeans, um, tofu, gluten. Those type of products are actually 
uh, what are called secondary sources of prote uh, protein. And so we, as vegetarians, eat those uh, to get the protein we need in our diets instead of eating animal products. So meat alternatives are just as dangerous. They've got protein in them and bacteria and other, other microorganisms love those foods just as much as they love the, the meat, um, the, the materials from animal products. So somebody who's a vegetarian is just as likely to get food poisoning as somebody who is not. And that's something you need to be aware of. All right, so let's very quickly go through these. Meat, poultry, and seafood. Meat, from the point of view of a vegetarian, is anything that basically was living. And uh, so therefore, meat it, for a vegetarian is all three of those at the top of the slide. However, in terms of food safety, meat is generally, and I'm putting this in a really simple way, is anything that uh, lives on land. So if it has, if it's lived on land in any way, shape or form, it is meat. So that would include things like snake, it would include uh, buffalo, it would include wallaby, kangaroo, the, the traditional ones of the cows and, and, and so forth. Anything that lived on land is therefore, is, is, is in simple terms, is considered meat. Poultry, uh, in very simple terms, is considered to be anything with wings. So in this group, you would even include emu. Um, so emu would definitely be considered to be poultry. It's a bird, and so it's poultry. Um, you would also, so typically in there, you would think it would be things like, uh, you know, chicken, uh, turkey, duck, those type of things. But it would also include things like penguin or the kiwi bird or, you know, those type of things. Anything with wings is going to be poultry. Uh, and the reason that we keep these things separate, meat, poultry, and I'm about to talk about seafood, is because different bacteria will grow in, diff in, these, in different ones of these. And, for example, with poultry, one of the reasons that salmonella isn't the only bacteria that grows in poultry, but it is fairly, it's, it, the, the two of them are very closely linked. So, and it's because of the process of actually slaughtering and removing the meat from, from the bird means that something like salmonella and other bacteria are more likely to get into the meat or uh, onto the meat than say it would be with with um, when they're slaughtering a cow so therefore poultry is 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 has to be treated in its own particular group so meat poultry and the last of these is seafood seafood here from the point of view of food safety from the point of view of food poisoning. Now, food poisoning is about bacteria and viruses and the like making somebody sick, okay? So seafood is anything that lives in water. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's fresh water or whether it's salt water, it's water. So meat is anything that lives on land. Poultry is anything with wings. Doesn't have to fly, but anything with wings. Seafood is anything that lives in water. And anything that lives in water, that could include things, for example, the Mexican walking fish. Uh, it would include um, a whole variety of animals or, or, or animals such as that. Even though, for example, a whale is actually a mammal, it lives in water. So it's for the point of of food poisoning is considered to be seafood, even though in reality it actually sits more with the animals who live on land because it's a mammal. But here we're separating them out based upon where they actually live and what characteristics they've got. So meat, anything that lived on land, uh, poultry is anything with wings, and seafood is anything that basically lived in water. All right. Now, cut fruit and vegetables is the next one on this list. Now, just like us, um, any fruit vegetable that actually has the skin removed or or punctured allows bacteria to get in and if bacteria can get in um just like with us we like to eat uh fresh fruit and vegetables and um so therefore bacteria are in much the same situation so if you cut the skin of a fruit or a vegetable you're allowing any bacteria that's on the knife the board the air your hands your breath uh, whatever clothes you might be wearing, you should be wearing an apron, but all of that can then actually get into the food. So cut fruit and vegetables. Just like us, if you stop and think, our skin is designed to protect us from things getting in, and it does have tiny holes to allow uh, air and um, sweat and whatever else to, to move, but if you actually cut it, any bacteria that might have been on your skin, any bacteria or whatever that might have been on your skin, is now going to get into the muscles and bone, uh, the muscles and whatever else happens to be underneath. So therefore, cut fruit and vegetables are in the same boat. Now, when we cut ourselves, we'll use some sort of anti antiseptic to actually kill the bacteria and anything else, and then we'll to make sure it's nice and clean. We then cover it up uh, and, and allow it to heal. 
Cut fruit and vegetables, on the other hand, once you cut it, any of the material, any of the bacteria, dirt, whatever that might be around, is now going to be inside. So cut fruit and vegetables are considered to be potentially hazardous. Potentially hazardous means that they contain food poisoning bacteria, not only bacteria, but viruses. They contain pathogens. And if not handled properly, they will allow the bacteria and the other pathogens to grow. So therefore, potential they are hazardous potentially. They are they already contain bacteria, but if you don't handle them properly, that bacteria will rapidly grow. So therefore, cut fruit and vegetables are just as dangerous as meat, poultry, seafood, etc. Most times when I ask people in face-to-face -face training, um, and not only face-to-face, -face, but when I'm actually running training, they'll say to me, I'll say, okay, what food do you think causes the most food, food poisoning? And most people, 90% of people will actually turn around and say, chicken. And then they'll all say seafood. And the answer is, well, actually, it's not either of those. Most people will say that straight away. And yes, they are things that most people would associate with food poisoning. But in Australia, the number one cause of food poisoning is, in fact, eggs. So eggs are a potentially hazardous food as well. But the biggest food poisoning, I'll come back to eggs in a minute, the biggest food poisoning in world history was actually the one that I was talking about before where we had 3,000 people with um, with food poisoning and 50 people died. The that, that was actually from bean sprouts. So... See, cut fruit and vegetables are just as dangerous. And in that particular situation, they they had discovered E. coli. The product wasn't washed um, like they are in Australia. And as a result, all these people ended up being sick. We don't have that problem anymore in Australia because, remember I mentioned the Food Standards Code before, in Chapter four, uh, chapter 3 of the Food Standards, oh, Chapter 4 of the Food Standards Code, it talks about um, primary production standards. So in there it actually says anybody who is producing things like sprouts needs to follow certain steps to make sure they're safe for people to eat. So that is now not an issue as long as they're following those rules. All right, eggs. Eggs are a huge problem. Um, we recently had um, the biggest food poisoning in Australian history happened uh, in, uh, in May of two, 2013 and it was actually as a result of cracked eggs being used. And uh, eggs are just like our skin. The outside, the shell of the skin of the egg, of the egg is just like our skin. It's there to protect what's inside. If that shell is actually uh, has any holes in it or, or cracks in it, the bacteria that happens to be in the air, on the surface, wherever it might be, is going to get inside and grow happily. So if those, if there's cracked eggs, they can be used, but they have to be used. That they have to be opened, and the the material inside, the egg inside, has to be cooked. You can't use cracked cracked eggs for raw products and unfortunately that is the issue that uh, actually happened and so we ended up with uh, at least 80 people and five people in hospital so um, yeah it's eggs are our number one issue in Australia not in the rest of the world um, but definitely here in Australia all right dairy foods I need to explain here uh, dairy foods different dairy foods are going to have different uh, amounts of moisture now Bacteria, just like us, we need a certain amount of moisture every day in order to be able to live comfortably and for our systems to work properly. Bacteria are the same. If they don't have enough moisture, they're not going to grow. Uh, and if they don't grow, the, then the food is, is, is relatively safe. And that's why a food such as biscuits, bread, um, cakes, scones, chips, uh, crisps, depending upon how you want to call them, they're actually, um, they're not potentially hazardous foods because they have such a low moisture content, comparatively, that they don't allow bacteria to grow. They might allow moulds to grow, but they don't allow the food poisoning bacteria to grow. Uh, you're going to see moulds, and really if there's a mould on a food, particularly in the business you're working in, if there's any mould on a food, you throw the whole lot out um, because moulds uh, are, are, are quite dangerous. Bacteria, on the other hand, you can't see. You can't smell them, you can't see them, you don't know they're there. So moulds you can see and you will know to throw them away. Food poisoning bacteria cannot be seen or smelt and so you're very. it's very hard. Uh, there are some that can but generally uh, in the world that we live in you can't smell or see them so we don't know they're there. So low moisture foods will actually allow moulds to grow but will not stop, will, but will stop uh, bacteria from growing. So we need to make sure that um, 
all the foods that are, have a high enough moisture content are actually kept refrigerated. Now, all of these foods that are on here need to be kept refrigerated. And the reason is because keeping food, these potentially hazardous foods in the, in the fridge, remember I said it, potentially hazardous if they're not handled properly. So if you're handling the food properly, they, and handling means keeping them cool, keeping them clean. Because what you want to do is stop bacteria that's in there from growing, or growing too much and you want to stop more from coming in so you want to stop contaminating or cross contaminating and you want to control and manage the temperature uh, which is why we're talking about both of those a little bit later so dairy foods are a really good example of how not all dairy foods are potentially hazardous let me give you a really good example there is a cheese a type of cheese it's called ricotta and it's very commonly used in with spinach and a few other things but it's ricotta it's quite moist and as a result it is definitely a potentially hazardous food it will if not handled properly will allow bacteria to grow and have a party and potentially make us very sick another type of cheese is called parmesan Parmesan cheese is a very dry cheese. It is about two years old from it, it, it ages for about two years before they actually pack it and sell it. And during that two years, it loses a lot of moisture. And as it loses moisture, it actually becomes less and less um, a food for bacteria to grow in. Uh, in fact, molds generally won't grow on Parmesan either. Um, so Parmesan cheese is not potentially hazardous, whereas ricotta, milk, those type of products that are high moisture are. Moisture isn't the only thing that determines whether a food is potentially hazardous, but it certainly has a big part to play. And it comes back to, it actually links to stock rotation and the thing I mentioned before about first in, first out, which we'll talk about shortly. All right, so the last one in the middle of this, looks like a target when you really think about it, is cooked rice and pasta. And I've just mentioned that, that when you have a high enough moisture content in something, it allows, it gives a good condition for bacteria to grow. So here we've got rice and pasta. If they're dry in the container in the cupboard, bacteria is not going to grow on it. There's not enough moisture to allow them to. However, um, once you cook it, you're not only making that nice and soft for us to eat, but you're actually adding moisture. When you're adding moisture, you're actually then boosting up the, the um, conditions for the bacteria to grow. So once the rice and or pasta have been cooked, uh, you need to make sure that uh, you keep them cold and you handle them just as well as you would handle the meats, the poultry, the seafoods, because they will allow bacteria to grow. There's in fact one particular type of bacteria called Bacillus cereus, which truly loves to grow in cooked rice and pasta. So they are the potentially hazardous foods. You must make sure you look after these foods. All right, you must. You need to be aware of them and you need to make sure you look after them. Okay, so that was the product. Remember the three P's. The, there was the pathogen, there was the product, and there was the person, or the people. Let's talk here a little bit about the people. You can see that there are four high-risk groups. The elderly, which is anybody who is, on average, 75 and above. It doesn't mean that it's exactly 75 and that's it, you hit the wall. No, it means that 75 generally is when this, when this issue starts to happen. And it's the same issue as happens with the young. And once again, here we've got four and under. It doesn't mean that it's four for everybody, but it's a general rule. So 75 and above is a general rule for elderly, and four and under is a general rule for young. These are the two main high-risk groups. Now, the reason they're high-risk is because they're more likely to get food poisoning, and if they get food poisoning, more likely to be very, very sick if they do. Now, the elderly and the young, what happens is your immune system, you're born with an immune system, it starts to kick in. And around the age of, as you can see here, four, uh, your immune system is then at a point where it's going to stay pretty much for the rest of its life. Um, there'll be ups, there'll be downs, they'll be moving around. But generally, that's where your immune system will be. So centers that are set up to look after kids who are four and under will have will have to have extra food safety controls in place to protect those people so they will have to have what is called a food safety program all right so that doesn't matter where you are in australia you'll have to have a food safety program so that's for for the young now the elderly what happens is it's a reverse at about 75 thereabouts um, depending upon the person the immune system will start to go down. It'll start to decline. It'll start to weaken. So those people are more likely to get sick, and if they get sick, are going to be very, very sick. The elderly have this extra complication. Apparently about that age, um, the amount of acid in your stomach also starts to decrease. And so if your immune system is not as strong, it's not going to be able to fight the bacteria as well. 
if they if they're bacteria in the food. And it'll also, if there's acid in the stomach, if there's less acid in the stomach, it'll also be less acid to kill bacteria. So two of the most important barriers that healthy adults have are actually reduced in the elderly population. So they are more likely to get sick. And if they get sick, in fact, they're more likely to be very, very sick and potentially die. In fact, in Australia, the majority of those that actually die from food poisoning are in this particular group, the elderly group. So any business that targets or specifically set up to look after elderly people, so aged care centres, respite centres, have to have some form of recognized food safety program that meets the requirements of, remember I mentioned before the Food Standards Code, in Chapter 3 it states all the requirements for food safety and in there, uh, one of those particular sections in there talks about um, the requirements for food safety programs. So both elderly and young, any business that targets those must have a food safety program that meets those requirements. So if your business where you're about to start working has got one is, is in one of those groups you will have to be meeting tougher requirements extra requirements on top of what say a restaurant or cafe would be meeting so because we have to put extra controls in place food safety controls in place to look after and prevent these people from getting sick there are two other groups as you can see there the immune compromised and pregnant women now i want to just focus for a minute on pregnant women come back to immune compromised pregnant women are a high risk group for for one main reason, there's a particular type of food poisoning bacteria. It's called Listeria monocytogenes. It causes, as one of its symptoms, if people get food poisoning from it, it causes spontaneous miscarriages. So therefore, women are pregnant women are more at risk of having, if they end up with food poisoning from that particular bacteria, they're probably not just going to get the typical symptoms of food poisoning, you know, vomiting, diarrhea. They're potentially going to lose the baby. Um, so that is a really serious issue and as a result they are considered to be high risk. Now when a woman is first told that she's pregnant, her doctor should be telling her that there are certain foods that she shouldn't eat. Now those are the foods that this particular bacteria, Listeria monocytogenes, likes to grow in. So uh, things like soft cheeses, uh, things like um, shellfish, these are foods that pregnant women should pretty much not eat for the entire period of their pregnancy to avoid the likelihood of coming in contact with that particular bacteria. So these are, they don't have to, you don't have to have any special food safety program as a business to look after these. These women need to re be aware of what they're eating and make sure that they're actually avoiding it. But businesses, all businesses need to make sure they're doing everything they can to avoid listeria being in their business and controlling it. So we'll talk maybe a little bit more about listeria later. The next and last group are what are called the immune compromised. These people are not necessarily sick. It means that they're not in, a, in the elderly group. They're, they're not in the ages where the immune system is getting stronger or, or, or is developing or, or weakening. They're healthy adults who, for whatever reason, their immune system is not working properly. Now, it could be a result of disease. It could be a result of a whole variety of things, but their immune system is not working properly. So therefore, their immune systems are compromised. Now, somebody who has diabetes might be in this group. But for example, let's take someone with diabetes. They are potentially immune compromised. Uh, their immune system is not going to be working as well as it would in a healthy adult. But the thing is that they're not sick. If they're medically controlled, they're diet controlled, they're getting good exercise, they're drinking properly, they're not smoking, they're doing all the things they're supposed to do in terms of controlling their disease, they're not sick but they are immune compromised. So this group, if you stop and look at it and think about it for a little bit, this is an increasingly large group in our society, especially as diabetes is rapidly increasing in our community, not only in Australia, but throughout the Western world, the, the, the developed world, you'll actually find that there's an increasing number of people in this particular group. Now, businesses such as hospitals, respite centres, aged care centres, these have got to have uh, food safety programs in place to protect this particular group um, and make sure that they are they are quite safe. Now, an aged care centre, just to highlight this, and there's a, there's a, an increasing number of aged care centres as our population ages. Um, of aged care with aged care centres, two of the high risk groups are actually found in that in those aged care centres: the elderly and the immune compromised. So 
those businesses are probably the most high risk of all types of food businesses because they've got two of the four high risk groups. They, they've got to have food safety programs to help the elderly, to make sure to protect the elderly, and those food safety programs would also therefore be helping and protecting the immune compromised. So they are the high risk groups, and if your business targets any of those, um, is specifically set up for to, to service to provide food to any of those groups of people, then you must have a food safety program. All right, let's talk about the hazards, the things that can get into food that actually cause our problems. I've got on here contamination and cross-contamination. That's what we're talking about here. Contamination, as it says, is stuff in the food that shouldn't be there. There's big, long definitions for it, but I'm putting it in really simple words. Contamination is stuff in the food that should not be there. And that stuff, you've got to do whatever you can, both as a business as, as well as a person working within that business, a staff member or volunteer, whatever you might be, working within that business to, to make sure there is no contamination. Now, cross-contamination is when we're moving that stuff from one place to the other. Now, businesses will do need to do whatever they possibly can to prevent these from getting into the food. Um, so making sure that, for example, using the right cutting boards, the color-coded cutting boards, that's done to, avoid, to prevent cross-contamination. You never, ever cut up meat on the same board as you cut up fruit and veggies because there are different, as we said before, different bacteria in the, in the meat than in the fruit and veggies. You don't want to cross-contaminate one or the other. You make sure if you've, you've got a raw food on a plate and you've then taken that plate over over and you're cooking the, the the meat say for example it is you don't put the cooked meat back onto the onto the plate where the raw meat was these are really simple examples of cross contamination another way in the fridge in the cold rooms you never ever ever have the raw food sitting above the cooked food because if there's any material that actually drops from the raw food say for example blood which would contain from on meat, which would contain food poisoning bacteria, they would actually then drop onto the cooked food and you've then cross-contaminated the cooked food. So you need to be very aware of where things are. Don't just walk into a cold room or into a fridge and just shove food anywhere. Make sure that raw food is always below cooked food. Make sure also that you're keeping things separated to um, prevent cross-contamination. Now, there are three types of cross uh, three types of contamination or hazards. There's physical. These are things that can scratch, tear, or choke if somebody swallows them. And examples are glass, metal, plastic, um, wood, those type of things. Jewelry, for example, would fit into this category. Now, the basic rule in any in most food businesses is this: the only type of jewelry that you can actually wear are a plain wedding band, a plain wedding ring with no stones. No one's going to ask you to actually remove it. However, um, it is you've got to make sure that you wash it when you're washing your hands, that you wash it very well as well. The other and only other thing that nobody is ever going to ask you to remove, and it's from a safety point of view, are medical alert type bracelets that actually are there to inform people that, hey, if I collapse and you can't and I can't talk to you, this is going to tell you that I've got these particular medical issues. And so um, ambulance officers, paramedics would then be able to address those knowing what the so instead of somebody verbally telling them they're actually able to look at the the bracelet and so no one's going to ask them to take those off but once again when people are washing their hands they need to make sure that those two the ring and the medic alert type bracelet are washed very well as part of the hand washing process they're the only types of jewelry that will generally be allowed some businesses will also allow tiny little earrings um, but the thing is if you're going to be wearing hair covering make sure that you actually cover your ears don't just put it on top of your head and wear it like a beret the hairnet um, cover the ears all right so they're the physical hazards the next are the biological hazards and the biological hazards are those that are or were living so the pathogens we've been talking about, the, the food poisoning bacteria, viruses, molds, they fit in this group. Others, other types of biological hazards or contaminations would be things like hair, would be things like blood, feces, droppings from animals, um, bits of animals. Uh, it would include things like mice, rodents, uh, other rodents. It would include spiders, cockroaches. If you think about all of the wonderful, delightful things that you have heard of or have experienced in food, a lot of those sit in that biological group. So we've got to do whatever we can to prevent those. So businesses will have things like pest control programs. It will have cleaning programs, which we'll talk very briefly about in a minute. So by, uh, pest control programs and, and, and uh, cleaning programs are mandatory requirements because we're trying to help stop these biological hazards. 
Lastly are the chemical hazards. Now, chemical hazards, there's two types. There's chemicals that are in the business and there's chemicals in the food. Now, chemicals in the business are things like cleaning chemicals or pest sprays or chemicals used for maintenance. And these must all be what is called food grade. And you will hopefully be getting, as part of your induction into the business, a, a an explanation about the different chemicals you use and how you actually use those. We're not going to cover it here, but you just need to be aware that you need to follow the very specific rules for handling chemicals, for using chemicals, and for also, if you're going to be mixing chemicals, you need to follow very careful rules. And always be aware there is a thing called a safety data sheet, and that safety data sheet will be in the area of the chemicals, and you'll look up there what to do if something goes wrong. All right, so that's chemicals that are in the business. Chemicals that are that are in the food come in two types. First is, is chemicals that are used um, for growing or producing the actual raw materials. So chemicals that might be used for spraying crops or for pesticides or herbicides, those type of things. Now, when you're in, in the business, you need to make sure that all vegetables, fruits, those type of uh, produce are actually washed before they're used. And what we're trying to do there is get rid of any dirt and as many of these chemicals, farm chemicals, as we possibly can. So that's chemicals that are in the food. The last type of chemical in the food is not actually a chemical. It's, it's something that's within the food. It's a component of the food. It's part of the food. But it sits in this category in, in this hazard because there really isn't anywhere else for it to go. Um, it sits here as a chemical hazard because it's actually part of the chemistry of the food. And here we're talking food allergens, which I want to talk about shortly. All right, so they're the three types of hazards, physical, biological, and chemical. And it's your job uh, as a food handler, as somebody working within the food business, to do everything you can by following the rules, using your eyes, keeping an eye on things, uh, making sure that you follow all those rules to stop these from getting into the food, from contaminating or cross-contaminating the food. Now, just a quick one here before we move off hazards. Tampering is deliberate contamination of the food or food surfaces. And that means that somebody, either a staff member or a uh, or a customer, has deliberately put something into the food or onto food, surf onto food contact surfaces like benches or cups or bowls or whatever um, to actually deliberately um, contaminate the food. If you suspect, even if you suspect it's happened, not if you know, but if you suspect it's happening, tell your supervisor, tell your manager, tell your boss, and they need to follow certain procedures that need to be in place. But you need to be aware tampering is something that can happen. It does happen. I've actually experienced it. I've been involved in investigations about it, and I know it does happen. So if you suspect it's happened, inform your supervisor straight away. All right, there are the hazards. Very quickly, I want to cover cleaning and pest control. As I said, all cleaning chemicals will have a safety data sheet. Make sure when you're actually cleaning that you follow the procedures. There's a lot of reasons why, but one of them is to make sure that you protect your... The rules, the procedures are set up to protect food safety, to make sure the food is safe, and to make sure you're safe. So if you follow those procedures, every single time the job is done, regardless of who's doing it, it will be done the same way. So that way we make sure there's little likelihood of um, contamination occurring. So make sure you follow those procedures. There is a difference between cleaning and sanitizing. Cleaning is where you make sure everything is visibly clean, as I've got on the slide here, visibly clean. You can't see a scrap of food anywhere. You can't see any dirt, anything. You use your eyes and you look and you can't see anything. That's visibly clean. Sanitizers, on the other hand, you will only use a sanitizer once you know it's visibly clean. You then will use the sanitizer, which is a fairly strong chemical, and that sanitizer is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and it kills bacteria. That's it. It kills bacteria. It does not kill allergens. So you need to make sure that you have visibly everything visibly clean first. That is the most important part of a cleaning program. Then, and only then, can you sanitize. So cleaning program will have four stages, and there is a record. Now, there is no point in you as a staff member or as a volunteer doing any cleaning if you do not actually keep a record. So there'll be a sheet somewhere in your business and you'll be shown that as you, you get into your job of um, what to do. It, it'll show you what to do, when to do it, and you'll need to record that you actually do it. And it'll often be just as an initial to show that it was you. There are four steps to cleaning. There's a pre-clean. So you're basically, for example, with a grill, you'll be scraping the, the surface down. 
and getting rid of all of the burnt on stuff first. Then there's the wash, which is where you use your cleaning chemical. After that, you'll be rinsing and you need to use fresh, clean water for that. And depending upon what the, the requirement is, you might be using hot. Be aware of all of the safety requirements. Make sure that you don't burn yourself. Wear all the, the personal protective equipment or PPE that you need to wear as the procedures tell you to. Then there's drying. Ultimately, the best way of drying is what's called air dry. Uh, but if we can't air dry, then we'll use disposable paper towels which means you dry it with a paper towel and you throw it away. So be aware that disposable stuff means you use it once and then you throw it away. Now with pest control there should be a log or a record somewhere in your business that if you see a pest and here we're talking not human pests because sometimes they are annoying but we're talking rodents, insects, those type of things. If you see that there needs to be a place somewhere that you write that down. Um, and there should be a map that actually shows where all the pest stations are, the, you know, the traps or whatever it might be. That's pest control. Food allergens, just very briefly. There are this here. I've actually got the list here that shows what the allergens are right in the middle. They are dairy, eggs, shellfish, fish, seeds, soy, peanuts, nut, and gluten. The number one food allergen in Australia is this one, gluten. Um, some huge percentage of the population believes they're actually allergic to gluten um, or sensitive to it or feel better if they don't consume it. Gluten is in fact a protein. It's found in oats, wheat, rye and barley and any product that contains them. So gluten is our number one allergen in Australia and most people would have you think that it was peanuts. Just to highlight here, peanuts are in fact not a nut. They are a member of, they are a legume. So soy and peanuts are actually relatives. Uh, they're both legumes, they're both beans or, you know, things that grow under the ground. So they're legumes. They are actually related. Uh, nuts are things that grow on trees. So if you think about it, the almond nuts, uh, the almonds, the Brazil, the, the macadamias, they all grow on trees. Often for the point of the exercise, uh, many businesses will bundle the peanuts and the nuts together because it's just easier to handle them that way. But you need to be aware that in reality, peanuts are not actually a nut. Um, and a lot of people, if you're born with a peanut allergy, you're most likely to actually have it for the rest of your life. Around about 2% of the Australian population, and that number is increasing, has an allergy to one or more of these foods. Um, you'll notice gluten, in fact, is not a food. These are all foods. Gluten is a protein. It is not the foods, it's not these foods that cause the allergic reaction. It is protein, a protein present in them. Now, just to clarify, lactose is not the protein that is in dairy. Lactose is, in fact, a sugar. Anytime you see OSE on the end of something, it'll often mean that it's a, uh, it's a sugar. So uh, lactose is not the protein that's the issue here. So here we're not talking about people who are lactose intolerant or lactose sensitive or something. This is a different situation entirely. Here we're talking a protein in dairy foods that causes an allergic reaction. Same with eggs. It's different proteins in different ones of these. So except for gluten, it's um, we haven't they don't separate the protein out because the protein actually is what makes up part of is part of what makes up these foods. Whereas gluten has actually been separated out and is used. Um, it, it it can be separated out and used as its own ingredient. Um, just as with with us vegetarians, we actually this is as I said is a protein and we use that as an alternative to eating meats and poultry and seafood. However, um, it is found in um, wheat, oat barley and rye. So any food that contains those will also have gluten. So just be aware they are the allergens. You've got to do everything you possibly can to make sure they can be traced within the business, that they are separated. So we're talking before about separating the raw and the cooked. You also need to make sure that the allergens are separated in the uh, in the fridge. There's a um, need to make sure that people have been trained in what allerg the allergens. They need to make sure they're making sure all surfaces, all contact surfaces with food are uh, visibly clean. Um, people, your customers need to be able to make an informed choice. So you need to be able to tell them or be able to show them what is actually in the foods, what is in all of the products. Uh, and there are methods that are used to do that within businesses. Scheduling. Businesses will often, um, say for example in a kitchen, if they're going to be making a prawn product, uh, say a restaurant, they're gonna they'll make the prawn product towards the end, at the end of when they're making things, so that way the shellfish will not be contaminating the the, the that particular seafood will not be contaminating other things. So you the businesses will schedule to avoid um, allergens getting into things. The important thing here is 
that you need to make sure the law says it will be nil unintended allergens in a food. An intended allergen means that it's in the ingredient list or the recipe. So it's meant to be there. One of these or these, whichever one of these, is meant to be in the recipe. And it's in the recipe, so therefore it's meant to be there. That's an intended allergen. It becomes unintended if it's not meant to be there. So the law says it will be nil unintended allergens in a food at all times. You're not allowed to even have the smallest trace. Now, very quickly with allergens, there is a, I want to tell you a very quick story, just to reinforce how small an amount it can actually take. There was a doctor at a party in the States. It was a Sunday afternoon. They were having a marvelous time. Suddenly, one of the, doc uh, the doctor um, had to do CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth on a guy because he had a heart attack. They dragged him out of the pool. The doctor did the the CPR mouth to mouth and the guy recovered from the heart attack and he was talking away the next thing that three minutes later um, he'd actually died so they they didn't know what had happened so they had to do a, an autopsy and they found that his trachea or windpipe which is the one you can feel right at the front of your neck uh, had actually completely seized up it wasn't allowing oxygen up it wasn't allowing oxygen out um, so it had stopped and um, as a result the guy had actually died now they realized that he'd had anaphylaxis, which is this extreme allergic reaction. And they then tracked it down and they found the doctor had been eating peanuts at the party and there was enough on the doctor's lips and breath to cause that guy to die. So that's why the law says there must be nil unintended, not even a trace. So you've got to make sure that if there are allergen controls or things that you've got to do to that, that rules that are in place about allergens, make sure that you're doing them um, because you could literally kill somebody within three minutes because if the brain doesn't get, the cells in the brain don't get fresh oxygen, uh, at, you know, every three minutes or so, um, they actually start to die. So the longer it goes, the more cells die, the more you're not going to be coming back. So you literally can kill somebody if you do the wrong thing with allergens. Now, you can, you can make somebody very sick from food poisoning and potentially kill them. But here with the food allergens, you, in your hands, have the power um, to do the right thing. You have the power to do the wrong thing. And if you do the wrong thing, somebody could actually eat the food and die in their plate right in front of you. So allergens are incredibly serious. All right, very quickly, a few common pathogens. Um, as I've said, these are the one; these are bacteria and others that can make us sick. Um, they need to be tested. There should be, if you've got a food safety program, there should be regular testing going on, particularly the cleaning, to make sure that the cleaning is visibly clean and the sanitizing is killing all the bacteria. It's done by a certified lab. But often now you'll find that smaller businesses are using what are called test strips, protein test strips, and you'll see somebody come around and they'll, they'll rub a surface, uh, the bench or the like, or a cutting machine or whatever it might be, with a, um, with a, with a, like a pull strip, like, uh, like they do for testing pee to make sure you haven't got protein. So it's the same type of issue, same type of thing. Examples of food poisoning bacteria, I've already mentioned E. coli. Salmonella, there are 2,000 different types of salmonella. Uh, 200 of them are pathogenic or hu uh, make human beings sick. Golden staff, I spoke about golden staff earlier. Its actual name is Staphylococcus aureus. It's called golden staff because it's actually little round balls and they're a gold color, so golden staff. Bacillus cereus is the one that makes us, uh, that is really commonly um, linked to cooked rice and pasta. Compilobacter jejuni um, is the number one cause of food poisoning in Australia. This bacteria is the number one cause. It causes more food poisoning than just about all the others put together. Um, and it is, yeah, commonly, it's, it's, it's quite common. Um, salmonella is the number one cause. A type of salmonella is the number one cause of food poisoning in Queensland. But in Australia, it's this one here. And its nickname is Campy because there's too much words to say, so we call it campy. Listeria monocytogenes, remember that's the one I mentioned with regard to pregnant women. This one here, if anyone's heard of the word Botox, this here, can you see the bow? There's where the bow comes from. This bacteria here, Clostridium botulinum, produces a, uh, a toxin or a poison, and it's that poison that actually gives us food poisoning. Um, somebody somewhere has actually uh, is farming this and they are producing um, quantities of that poison. That poison is then diluted down significantly, hugely diluted down and is then being used uh, and branded as Botox. So um, yeah, it was originally developed, uh, this Botox was originally developed to help people who have things like spina bifida to um, help with their nerves and to give them movement they hadn't had before, which was just fantastic. And somebody thought, oh, we can inject that into people. So Botox, this is where Botox comes from. 
All right, today are the common pathogens, just a few examples. Let's talk very briefly about temperature. There are three things we need to consider here. The law, what the temperatures are, and different types of thermometers. The law says that if you've got potentially hazardous food, which we talked about before, you've got to do temperature checks. And you've got to have a thermometer that is accurate to plus or minus one degree. And we'll very quickly go down here and we'll look at these thermometers. There are three basic types of thermometers. There are what are called guns, which is what we call it in the industry. They're not actually guns. Um, they, uh, they, they're shaped like a gun. You actually just hold it as you would with a pistol. You hold Hold it and you push the button and it shoots out a, a ray you don't see it it bounces it hits a surface bounces back and a little sensor inside the gun the, the, the device reads it and tells you what the surface temperature is so these are only good for surface temperature they're very quick um, they're reasonably accurate uh, and um, they're often used for receival temperatures or for equipment temperature they are no good absolutely no good for doing internal temperatures of food. So to do that, you need to have probes. And every food business should have at least one probe. There are two different types, a digital and gauges. Gauges are just like the little picture I've got over here, um, where you can you have the probe bit down the bottom and you have a dial thing at the top and a little needle swerves around and it shows you what the temperature is. Um, they're not especially accurate and they're very easily damaged. Um, they can be calibrated to make sure they're actually reading properly, you know, this accurate to plus or minus one degree. And they're probably the cheapest type of thermometer there is around. Um, but the best type of thermometer, uh, and they sell for around about the $50 mark, are the digital probes. So just like this one, it's got the probe part down the bottom. But up here, instead of having this needle that goes around, it actually has a digital display, just like a digital watch. Um, and the really good thing about the digital probes compared to the gauges is that this will actually tell you that it's 5.2, 5.3, 5.4. Um, whereas this guy, the um, gauge would just show that it's 5. Now, the thing that's important about that is this, this temperature danger zone. The maximum temperature in all cold equipment is actually allow is only allowed to be a maximum of five. So if you're using a gauge and it says five, you've got to assume it's five. Whereas if it's 5.1, 5.2, you're already above the, you're already breaking the law. But this wouldn't tell you that. This would just say it's five. Whereas the digital is going to tell you that it is, you know, 5.1, 5.0. Oh, I got a problem. Okay. So just be aware that there's the two that are out there. Uh, most businesses now will be using the little digital ones. Um, and there's also things called data loggers. And you probably don't need to worry about those, but that's another type of, of thermometer that's out there. So most businesses that you, when you're, if ever you're having to take temperatures, you'll most likely be using one of these type of probes, the, uh, the digital or the gauge. And I hope that you'll be using the digital ones because they're much more uh, accurate. They give a better reading. All right. So here. Um, the temperature danger zone. It's called the temperature danger zone because bacteria double um, generally um, every 20 minutes, some a bit more, some a bit less, but every 20 minutes at room temperature. So room temperature is somewhere between the 25 to 35 degree mark, depending upon where you are. Mind you, this time of the year in Queensland, it's, it's colder than that, but generally it's between 25 and 35 degrees is what's considered to be room temperature. Um, so that's the middle of the danger zone. And that's where bacteria will double the most and double most quickly. And that's obviously where we getting we get the most bacteria being produced. The thing is this, the longer a product, a potentially hazardous food is in the danger zone, the more bacteria it contains. So the aim is obviously simple. It's very, very simple. We want to keep it below the danger zone or we want to keep it above. So the danger zone is this, 5 to 60 degrees. So below five, bacteria slow down. So instead of doubling every 20 minutes, as an example, they might double once an hour. So therefore, that's why we have, we keep our potentially hazardous foods in the fridge. We know they've already got bacteria in them by keeping them and handling them properly, handling them properly by keeping them in the fridge and keeping them cold, or keeping them above 60 degrees, we actually are keeping them out of that danger zone and slowing the bacteria down. So below five, bacteria slow down. Minus 18, which is the freezer temperature. Um, now, remember here I'm talking Celsius. So minus 18 Celsius, um, the food, the, whatever the food is, is solid frozen. Now, you put us in the, free, in the freezer at that temperature and we're not coming back. Um, we are solid frozen and we're not coming back, not until they work out how to do it. But right now, it's not possible. Bacteria, on the other hand, they simply just go to sleep. 
they're still there, they're still alive, they just go to sleep. Uh, when you thaw the food out uh, and you get it in the fridge, the um, bacteria then start coming along, coming awake again and um, start doubling. Now, here's something you need to be aware of. Bacteria don't double like or don't reproduce like we do. With human beings, you need two of us to get together and you've got one and, and they produce one or, you know, twins or whatever it might be. But it takes two of us to actually do that. With bacteria, that's not how it happens. Bacteria, one's there, it reaches a certain point. Uh, and you don't need to know the chemistry, but it reaches a certain point and it just splits. And that happens at room temperature about the 20 minute mark. So the longer a food is in the danger zone, the more of that, that splitting is going on, the more bacteria we have. So therefore, we've got to keep foods out of the danger zone. So the key temperatures here so far are minus 18. That's the temperature we keep frozen foods at because the bacteria are dormant in other words they're asleep they're not doing anything so food can stay at that temperature for you know ever and ever um, the quality will deteriorate as it dries out because of the air movement but it'll be safe we've then got to keep our cold foods and our cold equipment between zero and five five is the maximum it doesn't mean 5.1 5 but it means five okay so five is the maximum temperature for uh, the the cold foods and cold equipment. Now, 60 degrees is therefore the minimum temperature, because that's the top of the danger zone, for um, reheating foods. So if you've got a cold food and you're reheating it back up to make it nice and, nice and hot to eat, you've got to go above 60, obviously. And if you're holding food, uh, you know, like you would in a hot box or a bay-marie, which you would in a takeaway or, you know, um, or if you're, you're restaurant and the like, uh, buffets, you would actually need to keep that food at at least 60 degrees, probably even higher, but at least 60 degrees to keep it above the danger zone, okay? There's one other temperature that, that was, yeah, there's one other temperature that's important, and that is when you're cooking food, you don't just cook it to 60 degrees and go, yay, because 60 degrees doesn't kill everything. You, the higher the temperature you go, the more bacteria you kill. That's ba that's another basic rule. So you've got to go to at least 70, 70, at least 75 degrees in order to kill majority of the bacteria. Uh, so once you cook it right up to at least 75, and most times it'll go much higher than that, but at least 75 degrees to kill the majority of bacteria and you can't just get it to 75 and go yay um, it's all done you got to hold it there for a certain period of time and that's probably a good five minutes so um, minus 18 is the temperature for the freezers and frozen food maximum of five for cold food and cold equipment uh, minimum of 60 for reheating and holding of food and minimum of 75 for cooking your food. They're your main temperatures that you need to know and that you need to make sure are being followed. So if you have to take temperatures, they're the temperatures that you've got to be. They're the guides, not the guides. They're the standards that you actually uh, need to work to. Now, the important thing is also, just like we were talking about cleaning, if you're taking temperatures, there is no point in taking them unless you actually write it down because you need to be able to prove that the temperature was what it actually was. So doing the job is not only about taking the temperatures, it's also about writing it down. And I'm quite sure that... Um, as part of your, your training when you go into your work area, if your job involves taking temperatures, you'll actually there'll be a procedure for how to do that in your business and you'll actually be trained in how to actually take the temperatures in your business using the equipment that you've actually got. Um, so keeping records and all thermometers need to be, the probes in particular, need to be, particularly if you're doing internal temperatures of food, need to be calibrated uh, on a regular basis. You don't need to know about it. You don't need to know how to do it. It'll be done by your super, by your food safety supervisor or manager, but you need to be aware that it's actually happening. That's temperature. Now, stock rotation, I mentioned fairly briefly before. It's called, it's, there's a law and we're talking about three major dates. It's the law. Stock rotation or practicing the principle of first in, first out is the law. You've got to do it from a receival all the way through the process. It gives us traceability. It means that we can actually identify where things are. And it means that we're not likely to be using product that has passed its use-by date, um, and that's against the law. So it's against the law to use product that's passed its use-by date, um, because use-by date means that the product is, is, has a low, a low enough bacteria level that it's not going to cause harm um, to healthy adults. So you're not allowed by law to use anything that's passed its use-by date. And so FIFO, or first in, first out, is the principle we've got to practice. Now, if you see on this picture here, this is actually taken in an aged care centre, uh, and they have a type of food preparation called cook chill. This here actually clearly identifies that that, 
that tray is to be used on Thursday, this tray is to be used on Friday, and this one's on Thursday as well. So here we've got um, traceability happening really well, and on you can't see it, but in this patch just here it'll actually clearly state what the food is. Uh, and now you also see that these trays are actually quite thin, and that means that when they're cooling them down, they can get them down below that five degree mark very, very quickly in their blast chiller. So, and you can see it's a nice clean setup. This is a really nice aged care center and uh, they can get, this is five days. So this food here um, is made and it has a uh, five day. So five days later, the, um, the residents are eating it and it's designed to be just like it was freshly cooked. It's a brilliant process. So FIFO is the principle you've got to be following. First in, first out. So the first stock to come in is the first stock to actually be used. Uh, a good example of that is when you go shopping in the supermarket. Uh, where do you get the milk from? Um, you will always, everybody will, will generally always get the milk from the back because they know that the oldest stock is at the front. The newest stock is at the back. So you, you, you know about it, now you've got to make sure you're practicing that when you're working in a food business. So use by date, we've just covered. Best before is all about quality. And it is perfectly okay to use a product that's passed or a material that's passed its best before date. It all depends upon how far a business wants to go. So if you have anything in the shelf or that you can see on display or in fact in the pantry or the dry goods, whatever you want to call it, that is past its use by date, pick it up. Tell the supervisor, tell your manager, tell the food safety supervisor that you're throwing it out um, because you cannot, it cannot be used. Okay. Um, best before stuff, on the other hand, can. If you're not sure about the quality of something, if you're not sure about anything, ask your food safety supervisor, ask your manager. Now, baked on. Baked on is just used on bread and baked goods, and it uh, because we all know that bread is actually this best, you know, the day or maybe even the day after it's baked. After that, it starts to become a little not as nice. Um, it becomes good for toast then. <laughs> so baked on is used for uh, for baked goods and particularly for bread. So they're the dates that you need to be aware of. All right, hand washing. We're coming toward the end here. Hand washing. You need to be using what is called the Food Safety Information Council's 2020 rule, and it's the hand wash method. And if you are interested, you can actually go along to foodstandards.gov.au and on there um, and type in hand washing, and you'll be able to find there's a video that describes how to do it. These two um, here, these two pictures here, this is somebody's hand before they wash their hands using the 2020 method, uh, and it's 20 seconds wash. 20 seconds dry. So you need to actually put the soap onto your hands, antibacterial soap as it says here, and put it onto your hands, put it all over your hands, make sure that all surfaces are covered under the nails, on the fingernail, under the fingernails, everywhere, fingertips, everywhere. Making sure if you're wearing the jewel, wearing that ring, wearing the bracelet, that all of those are covered as well. And then you rinse it off. That soap stays on your hands for, for the count of 20 seconds. That's where this first 20 comes from. If you do that properly and then rinse off, preferably with warm running water, warm or hot running water, um, if you do that properly, that's what, see all these golden ones? They're golden staff as an example. All right, so there's quite a lot of bacteria there on that particular hand. And then this, then you rinse off and you dry on paper towel, not the back of your pants or anywhere else, dry on paper towel for 20 seconds, this is what happens. You can see what an improvement there actually is. So this is what happens when you do an antibacterial wash, um, you're following the 2020 rule. Now, 2020 rule applies every time you come into the kitchen. Um, if you're serving staff and you've come into the kitchen and you've picked up the plate, you've taken it out, you're coming back in to collect more, you don't need to be doing the 2020 in between. But if you've been out shopping, been had lunch, been to the toilet, been, even if you've been to the toilet and washed your hands in the toilet, who cares? Um, when you come back in, you make sure that as soon as you enter the kitchen, you do the 2020. 20, 20 seconds wash, 20 seconds dry. Okay, that's, and you can see quite powerfully here what the, the difference is.